It's happened twice. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now we've just got time for a brief uh, panel discussion. Might first see if any of the uh, the speakers have questions for each other. Actually, I have a question for Ian. Mm -hmm. uh, I like a lot your idea of the. I'm sure you can hear. Yeah. I should put the thing on somewhere. It's on, I think. But it's on. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, I like your idea of uh, designing the objectives to the representing the the morals or the ethics of the. Uh, of the machines, but typically ethical uh, principles are very abstract and machines are trained for very practical functional things and there is a whole link between Another discrimination or privacy. Can or you speak into the oh, microphone? So, sorry. Uh, there is a lot of uh, a big distance between the concept of privacy or the concept of discrimination or the concept of safety and the very practical uh, functions that the systems are built on, how you would propose to bridge that distance? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's not a, a solved engineering problem. There's no recipe of how you design those objective functions. And, and, and presumably, uh, you know, you can imagine the, the, the Asimov three laws of robotics could be kind of an example of, the, of those objective functions, but I never like them because they're not operational. They're not yeah. something you can sort of reduce exactly, to. Yeah. Uh, you know, to an objective that, that the machine can optimize. So you have to find substitutes of that that uh, achieve the same goal, but at the same time um, are, are easier to kind of uh, implement, if you want. Now, for the question of, uh, uh, which is kind of a more short-term ethical question about AI and machine learning, which is the issue of bias, uh, that's, that's not a question necessarily of designing the objective function of the machine. It's more of a question of uh, what's the appropriate data to train it on. So. Uh, a learning machine will reflect the biases that are present in the, in the training data that has been used to train it. And we've seen examples of you know, uh, some small companies that are not very experienced with uh, the, the, you know, the process of doing this, making very stupid mistakes in training AI systems with you know, reflect the biases in their data and you know, predicting that uh, you know, crime recidivists um, yeah, um, you know, you know there's, uh, some systems like this that some cities have, have bought to predict the rate of recidivism for, for particular per pe uh, people, and they're biased against uh, you know, people with dark skin. And uh, so there are mistakes like this that people shouldn't make. So one of the goals of the, the partnership on AI that uh, uh, David was, was uh, alluding to earlier, uh, some of the other founding members are in the room here, Francesca from, from IBM. Um, one of the purpose of this, uh, of this partnership for AI is to def define perhaps uh, guidelines and uh, uh, you know, ethical gui guidelines of how you build AI systems so that uh, they're not systematically biased, they don't reflect the, the, the worst aspects of society. Okay, um, time for some questions for the group. Okay, there's one there. Go ahead. Yep, Adam. <laughs> A hundred thousand years ago, there was a conference of um, Neanderthal-like creatures, and it was called the Ethics of Modern Human Intelligence. And they were very worried about being outcompeted by humans, and they raised all sorts of concerns. But now when we look back, maybe they really ought to have been outcompeted, and maybe it was a good thing. So when we worry about the future of artificial intelligence, what do you think about the possibility or the, the depressing possibility that we ought to you know, start preparing ourselves for dinner in the distant future because if we're worried about multiple emulations, maybe they ought to have more votes than us. Is that possible that, um, that what's ethical with respect to art artificial intelligence when it's sufficiently smart is just a question we ought to ask it? <laughs> Well, th there, there is room between um, the claim that we have reached the maximum of what is valuable and the claim that whatever happens is valuable or whatever is the most intelligent is valuable. It might be that there's a huge space of possible minds, possible modes of being, possible types of lives and experiences. Um, and that with our human wetware, we can explore a tiny corner of that vast space of possibilities. And in this much larger space, there might be some that are more valuable and a lot that are less valuable. And what we then would have reason to do is to try to find a trajectory that eventually leads to one of the more valuable regions. Um, it doesn't mean that 
<clears throat> just because something is smarter than us, therefore it would be a good thing if it took over. You could have, I think, uh, a super intelligence who's, uh, to take the classic example in, in this domain, whose only goal is to make paper clips. So you have a paper clip maximizer and it's very, very good at it. And it produces a world which is full of paper clips and nothing else except machinery to make more paper clips. Uh, by the metric of intelligence, it would be far superior to us. It might have the brain the size of a planet. Um, and yet, in terms of plausible accounts for what has value, it would be inferior to us. It might not even have any internal mental life. Um, so um, the question remains, even if you think that there could be ways of existing that would be more valuable than our present ones, uh, we still have to put in work to ensure that we reach those. Um, and I think, to me, a plausible account would be that the future is very big, that there's this enormous petri dish um, out there, uh, that we could have space both for fantastic continuations of the seven billion people who happen to live now, and also for all kinds of new exotic uh, super beings that it, 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 we should first make sure we satisfy all uh, legitimate, easily resource satiable preferences. If we can do that with a small fraction of the total, and then we can have a discussion as to how we use the rest of it, what additional things could be built. So the, the, uh, the interaction between uh, uh, two intelligent entities with different capabilities is something we're actually quite familiar with already. Um, first of all, inside of our own brains, right? So we have, uh, or let's say our reptilian brain that basically um, you know, has all those kind of low-level drives that uh, makes us feed and et cetera. And, and then, you know, the, the cortex on top of it that essentially is subservient to it, even though it builds on top of it, it's subservient to it. And so you could imagine that AI system would be kind of a, you know, um, an exocortex, if you want, that is subservient to our brains, uh, but extends its, its intelligence the same way our cortex extends the intelligence of a reptilian brain. Uh, so Gary Marcus, is Gary here? Has, uh, he's not here. Um, oh, here, okay. So, you know, it has this little, little book. You know, we disagree on many things, he and I, but, but uh, it has this nice little book called Kluge where, you know, he described this example of, um, uh, you know, you're, you're in, in front of a piece of chocolate cake and your reptilian brain says, go for the calories and your, you know, frontal cortex, which can do long-term prediction says, wait a minute, this is actually not good for you in the long term, so you shouldn't go for it. And sometimes your reptilian brain wins. So I think it would be kind of the same thing in our relationship to AI systems. They, they will probably do a much better job at doing world, world prediction. Right now they're terrible, but eventually they might be good at it. So they might do a, a good job at predicting what's gonna happen next, uh, and that will allow us to make better predictions. Uh, but in the end, uh, hopefully we'll be in control. It's not very different from the way we use computers today, right? We have large supercomputers doing weather prediction, and they are used as a world, model, as a, as, as a world predictor, as a, as a world model, uh, from which we can take, make decisions. So I, I don't think it would be qualitatively different from the interaction we have today. Also, I don't know about you, but as a manager in a, of an industry research lab, I'm very used to interacting with people who are way smarter than me, uh, and I'm their boss, right? So. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, this question is for Jan Wen. Uh, it can be open to uh, the other two speakers. Uh, I was just thinking of your predictions in the face of uncertainty and the kind of uh, prediction ribbon in the, uh, in the graph. And um, then I was thinking about the video and imagery predictors that, that you showed. And I was just wondering uh, with regards to, say, evidence in courts in the term, in like the, the very applied case of uh, criminal justice, at what point would you be comfortable with that being used as a application of evidence in terms of um, predictions of facial models uh, when it comes to CCTV footage and et cetera? Right, so I mean, there, there's a lot of different questions there. So uh, I mean, certainly there are uh, pattern recognition, vision, AI systems today that can be used for you know, forensic purposes um, and uh, uh, how, how they'll be accepted as evidence in court, I have no idea. I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer and I'm really not a specialist of those questions. 
But uh, you know, perhaps the, the same way DNA evidence is, uh, which is kind of statistical in nature, is also is also accepted, or, or photographic evidence, which is has diminishing value now that we can kind of tweak uh, uh, photos and stuff like that. Um, in terms of like the ability to predict, uh, basically what um, what forensics is about is retrodict. You have you observe a state of the world and you have to deduce a sequence of actions that that led to the state of the world essentially, right? You get to a crime scene and you have to figure out what happened. So it's retrodiction, not prediction. But it's the same problem. It's really very much a very similar kind of problem. Will the machine help us with this? Not anytime soon. Hey, uh, question for Jan, probably so popular today. Um, so if the machines, if we have an intelligent machine and its primary leash is a reinforcement to specific trainers, wouldn't the easiest way to get that reinforcement to be it, to put a gun to the head and force the positive signal? So I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. You're, you're yeah, so you suggested a mechanism for control for an intelligent machine is to assign specific trainers that the machine will crave positive feedback from. That was in one of your slides. So my question is, wouldn't the easiest way to get the positive feedback or to get them to push the button would be to put a gun to their head? Well, <laughs> I mean, what, one of the statements I made is that I thought reinforcement learning was actually a relatively minor uh, way of, of training machines. It's, it's a relatively minor way of training humans as well. So there's very little that we learn as humans that is uh, conditioned by reward and punishment. Most of what we learn is the vast majority of our knowledge is, uh, is through this, you know, possibly it's a hypothesis, of course, there's no proof of this, but it's through this uh, prediction and sort of modeling the world, uh, which is task independent. And then on top of this, you learn a task, perhaps using reinforcement or supervised learning, uh, and that if you have the proper representation of the world that has been built through unsupervised learning, then learning those tasks is very quick and requires just a few examples. So this is what is surprising uh, today. That's what creates the, the, the difference between the amount of samples that are necessary to train a, a supervised system today, which is thousands, whereas uh, you, know, you show three pictures of an elephant to a child and the child has figured out what's the, what an elephant is. So it's, you know, it's because there's a vast amount of knowledge that the, uh, the child can build on top of. Uh, it already has good representation of the visual world. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure I answer your question, but um, I, I see reinforcement as kind of playing a relatively minor role. Okay, this is one from I, I hate to return to this theme, but I, I continue to have the impression that the role of consciousness is being downplayed. So, for instance, when you said, look, um, should we be morally worried about disconnecting them? Well, we could build them in such a way that they don't care about being disconnected, and then somebody rightly pointed out that it might be just part of the functioning to have a certain kind of functional instinct for self-preservation. The question is, you know, if it has the functional instinct for self-preservation, uh, you know, Apple could easily design my laptop so that whenever I touch the off button, it said, ouch, don't turn me off, and so forth, and exhibited all kinds of seemingly caring about uh, being turned off. The real notion of caring about being turned off is one that appeals to the notion of consciousness, which has been left out of the discussion. So uh, I think all of these issues about whether we ought to have complicated moral views about how to treat systems turn on notions of consciousness which have not yet been figured out. Uh, it's certainly the epistemology of saying whether a unit, especially one that's functionally quite complicated and intelligent in some sense is conscious or not has not been settled and I think before we do that we can't really address these questions in a, in a correct way. Well so we have no problem going through anesthesia which is you know essentially indistinguishable from death except it's reversible uh, and so you know somehow so that's, that's the first point. Uh, second point is there's a lot of uh, small animals who clearly fear being turned off turned off uh, who I think most people would say are not conscious, 
or maybe they are. It depends on your definition of consciousness. So third of all, I don't know how to define consciousness. So that kind of uh, makes this, this question very difficult for me to answer. But if I had to make a guess as to what people think of as consciousness, is perhaps the ability to, uh, of this prediction system I was telling you, telling you, you know, I was talking about to uh, see yourself as part of the world, right? So you, you kind of observe yourself in your world simulator. The world simulator in, includes yourself. And, and so you, you have this feeling of, observing yourself you know, from, from the outside. Uh, why is that qualitatively different? I mean, why is there you know, some new sort of moral question about this particular effect in an intelligent machine? I'm, I'm not sure why there would be. Um, so, I mean, bottom line is basically I, I don't see I, the problem. I think consciousness probably has, like many other uh, aspects, there is gradations to it. There will be, co the fu I, I agree that I don't know how to define consciousness, but there will be, very many different levels of consciousness from it uh, uh, pre making us believe that it's con conscious to simulating consciousness to the full consciousness like we attribute to each other. So somewhere there in between will be the machine consciousness. I, I think <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Uh, thanks so much. This is a follow-up on some things that Professor Dignam was saying, but uh, I think everyone could chime in on it. Uh, it's about accountability and transparency. Mm -hmm. So if a machine learning algorithm has selected me as someone that the police should stop, we might think that I have a right to ask why I was selected. Yeah. But it also seems like the more powerful and efficient the algorithm is, the more complicated it will be and the harder it will be for us mere humans to have really any grip on why it's making any particular decision based on 10,000 different parameters. Uh, so I was hoping you could speak a little bit to uh, the trade-off between transparency and accountability and uh, how powerful and intelligent these things are. Yes, uh, you're right. Indeed, the more complex the algorithms are, the more difficult it will be for it to be transparent. Uh, however, uh, the making them more complex and uh, more efficient in the the operations they are trained for is maybe not always the, the way to go. We have to make a trade-off between uh, optimal uh, operational uh, function and uh, uh, transparent uh, operation. And I think that that trade-off uh, is where we have to, to look at uh, in designing those algorithms. And now we are mostly designing the algorithms from the operational efficiency. And uh, that, yeah. There has been a lot of discussion of um, artificial intelligence itself operating as a moral uh, judge, as a, as a moral system. But the more pressing question and the immediate question is um, on what basis should we decide what kinds of choices and decisions uh, to delegate to automated systems, um, and uh, what safeguards or what conditions on the operation of those systems are uh, required by moral standards that we ourselves are going to use. And um, I mean, I, I would just like to ask the panel uh, whether they think that that issue, the quest that this question is necessarily going to involve um, some attribution or design of moral judgment in the systems themselves. I don't think that that's obvious. Uh, 
it may be that all of the moral work uh, will have to be done by us. And um, just by way of analogy, there is a much older technology of delegation of choices to a quasi-automated procedure, which has you know, been extremely important, and that is the legal system. Uh, and about the design of the legal system, uh, the question, these questions are very important. What should be the moral standards that we use in deciding uh, to turn over to a set of largely automatically applied rules um, certain important decisions. And that kind of delegation has been a vital aspect of human civilization. Yeah. Now in the legal system, the parts of the machine that carry it out are human beings. And Sometimes, at least in common law systems, they have to make moral judgments themselves. But a great deal of the legal system is just carried out automatically. And you know, I would like to know why you think, if you do, that uh, AI, if it is given authority to make some uh, choices is going to have to operate sometimes like a common law system with moral judgments being made by the machines. I could, I mean, I think um, part of that connects to an earlier question, and one distinction is whether uh, the domain of application is the same or known to be very similar to the domain of testing. So in the limiting case, you have a set of points that you might want judgments over, and you can randomly select some and see how the algorithm works on those. And then you can statistically have guarantees that with a certain likelihood, it will operate within the wider domain from which you randomly sample. And, and there you might just want accuracy from the algorithm, and you can, you can have fairly strong guarantees that it will behave as you intended. But if you intend to apply it outside the domain in which you can test its performance, uh, then you need to have some understanding of how the system works uh, in order to be able to guess how it will extrapolate from the cases it has seen. And uh, uh, if you can't have that kind of guarantee, then you would want to have the ability to revise it, to supervise it, uh, to go in and change its decisions. Um, yeah, um, there's, there's a, f a funny thing, which is that the, in certain languages we call the law the legal code, right? And it's not by accident. It's, it's code in the same way as a program is code. Uh, that we call a computer program code. Uh, so it's you know, basically a set of rules that implement a combination of two things. One is in the little uh, diagram that I showed where you have the objective, which you know, encodes the, the, the moral value. You, you give it a state, of, a state of the world or a sequence of, of things, of actions, and it tells you whether it's good or not. Um, and then there is the agent that tells you, you know, produces actions that uh, are according to this uh, objective or not. And legal code, I think, is a combination of the two. So it's, uh, a, a, it's, it's a way to define an objective function for, for people in society to uh, make people behave in certain ways. So it defines the objective function for people in some ways. That's why there are incentives and, and, and punishment, basically, um, in, in the legal code. Um, so it's, it's kind of a substitute objective function that uh, makes it such that when people optimize this objective function, they ultimately maximize the common good if it's designed properly. Of course, it's very difficult. But you're right, it's, it's very similar. I mean, I see it in very, very similar terms, except legal code applies to societies, which are collections of people, whereas the objective I was talking about applies to a single entity or a single AI entity, and we have kind of a similar modules in our brain that sort of is our moral fiber, if you want. Yeah, um, this is a quick question. Uh, I was just wondering, so 
instead of kind of prescribing these more general, objective, moral claims to a machine, um, is it possible that we could sort of use this system of neural networks to upload, if you will, or dump, I guess, the history of philosophy or moral theory more in general and have the machine conclude on its own what might possibly be the best philosophical, <laughs> philosophical or ethical um, conclusion or standard to then hold um, other machines to, if you will. You will, right. so, you will find they're the same bias as in uh, other. Uh, people don't agree as well between cultures or between the different people on the the morality of many uh, actions and on the concrete uh, translation of moral uh, principles into uh, actions. So I think if you would take that uh, uh, that line of uh, that approach, we would find the same kind of bias in the decisions that the machines take as what we find now in the bias in the, uh, profiling and whatever. But it's an interesting uh, approach to consider. So I think there are two parts to, to philosophy. I mean, whatever I can see. The one is uh, the, the, the sort of model of the world part, which is, you know, if, um, if we behave in such a way, here is what's going to happen in long term. Like, why, why is it, uh, um, you know, good to have, uh, I don't know, democracy or something like that, or, you know, sort of general principles that, that uh, organize uh, 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 behavior? What, what would that lead to in the long term? So th that's the issue of uh, uh, predicting what a particular type of behavior will produce. Will it be good in the long term or bad in the long term? And a lot of the issues, political issues that people disagree on, is basically differences in prediction of what's going to happen in the long term or differences in weighting of uh, short-term versus long-term uh, objectives, um, like you know, cl climate change or things like that. And so I think um, um, the, um, yeah, I guess I'm going to stop here. <laughs> let, me, let me speak. Well, well, if there is going to be um, machines that surpass us in general, cognitive abilities in all domains, then uh, I think it casts a new li light on intellectual priorities. So there is a bunch of uh, problems that we could delegate, defer to the more capable reasoners that we think might exist in the future. That would include uh, a lot of uh, moral reasoning insofar as we think that there are progress that can be made by thinking about moral questions, that progress could be made better and faster and easier um, with these machines. So the, the task then becomes to isolate the subset of problems that we need to solve ourselves first, either because they are very pressing or because we need the answers to those questions in order then to be able to create this superintelligence in the right way. And all the other problems that we don't need to have solutions to between now and then, I think, have reduced urgency and can maybe be delegated uh, to, to the future. And so I, I argue for this principle of delegation, which is that when possible, with a lot of qualifications, we, we could sort of defer a lot of these detailed judgments to the, uh, the, the, the more efficient uh, minds that will exist in the future. And, and we shouldn't beg the questions. We shouldn't sort of lock in our own possibly flawed uh, guesses about factual matters. Uh, if, if we could instead leave that open to be revised and analyzed more efficiently by the better minds that we might build. Okay, we've gone over time, so we better end it there. Um, be, go, to, go eat at one of the very, many fine restaurants nearby and be back here at 1.30. But uh, let's thank all of our speakers for a great discussion. Thank you.